In this video, I'll be discussing a mysterious object, the Dirac Delta. Oftentimes in physics or engineering, the Dirac Delta is used as an idealization for a force applied over a very short period of time, or a charge localized to a very small region of space. As we'll see, there's lots of hidden math behind the Dirac Delta, and I hope to demystify the various issues that inevitably arise when trying to rigorously define it. The typical way the Dirac Delta is described is pretty loose and informal. It's supposedly a function that's zero everywhere except at x equals zero, where it's infinite. It also satisfies the sifting property, which says that multiplying it by a function f of x and integrating extracts the value of f at zero. Regrettably, this property is often presented as an afterthought, when in reality, it's the only characterization that gives us something to work with. Now, to be clear, the Dirac delta is not a function that maps real numbers to real numbers, because infinity is not a real number. So neither of these typical descriptions are mathematically precise, and things can go wrong pretty quickly. For example, if we integrate the Dirac delta against the function f of x equals 1, the sifting property tells us that the integral of the Dirac delta is 1. But the Dirac delta is zero everywhere except at zero. How can the area under a point be positive? Does this mean we need to define some strange convention like zero times infinity equals one? To avoid dealing with such arbitrary ideas, let's just say for now that the integral of the Dirac delta behaves much differently than it does for ordinary functions. To start on our journey of demystifying the Dirac delta, we'll need to reinterpret the integral entirely. Specifically, instead of thinking of integration as measuring area, we'll need to think of it as measuring mass. To do this, let's take a brief detour into measure theory, which provides us with a method of weighing sets of numbers. So let's say you have a rod that's one meter long, which we'll associate with the interval 0, 1, and we'll give it a uniform density of one kilogram per meter, so that its total mass will be one kilogram. Then if we pick a segment of the rod, its mass will be equal to the length of the segment. This function m is an example of what mathematicians call a measure, which is a function that takes in a set of real numbers and outputs a number that gives the mass of that set of numbers. This is in contrast to ordinary functions that take in numbers and spit out numbers, because measures take in sets of numbers, so measures could also be called set functions. Now, measures also need to obey some properties that cohere with how we should expect measurement to work in the real world, namely a property called countable additivity, which you can look into if you're interested. The example I just described, where a uniform density of one kilogram per meter is assigned to the real numbers, is called the Lebesgue measure, and it's probably the most important measure out there. We can also think of other types of measures. For example, if you assign a mass of one to the point zero, and a mass of zero to everything else, you get what's called the Dirac measure. If you interpret this in terms of densities, the Dirac measure assigns an infinite density to the point zero, since you're stuffing an entire kilogram into a single point. As you might have guessed, the Dirac measure is very closely related to the Dirac delta, and as we'll see later, this property is actually why the Dirac delta is often thought of as being infinite at zero and zero elsewhere. The question now becomes, how is the Dirac measure related to the Dirac delta? To do this, we need to reinterpret the integral in terms of our newfound knowledge of measures. We usually interpret the integral as measuring the area under the curve. But what if we instead think of it as measuring mass? Let's assign a measure mu to the real numbers, which just means different sets of real numbers weigh different amounts in a way prescribed by mu. Now if we define a function on this new weighted real line, we can define its integral as simply the mass of the region under the curve where we assume that the region has a uniform density in the y direction and a density prescribed by mu in the x direction. For example, a rectangle with height h and base given by the interval b b prime will have a mass of h times mu of b b prime. As a special case, when mu is the Lebesgue measure m, which, recall, just measures the length of a set or an interval, we get the integral we're all familiar with, and instead of writing dm, we usually just write dx. Now, in the special case when mu is the Dirac measure, delta, 
notice that the region under the curve has zero mass anywhere except the origin. So the total mass is the height of the function at zero times the Dirac measure of zero, which is just f of zero. So this is a pretty important fact. We've shown that integrating with respect to the Dirac measure does the same thing as the Dirac delta, namely, it extracts the function's value at zero. So this somewhat explains the sifting property. But why do we think of the Dirac delta as a function that's infinite at zero? The answer lies in the fact that some measures can be written as a density function times the usual Lebesgue measure. Measures that can be written this way are called absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. When we said the Lebesgue measure assigns a uniform density of one kilogram per meter to the real numbers, we were essentially saying that dx is equal to one kilogram per meter times dx. If we were to assign a uniform density of two kilograms per meter, our new measure d mu would equal two times dx. And we can make this density depend on x too. For example, we could define a measure d mu given by e to the negative x squared dx, and it turns out that this measure plays an important role in defining Hermite polynomials. Now, in the case of the Dirac measure, it doesn't really have a well-defined density function because it assigns an infinite density to the point zero, and this is not a function. But if we abuse notation and denote by delta of x the function which is infinite at zero and zero elsewhere, we can actually write that d delta as a measure is equal to the delta function times dx. Now, this is all very informal, but if we stick with this notation, we can actually recover the familiar sifting formula namely multiplying f by the delta function and integrating gives the value of f at zero. So we've come up with an integral representation of what the Dirac delta does in terms of the Dirac measure, and we've even explained why the Dirac delta is thought of as a function that's infinite at zero. But what actually is the Dirac delta if it's not a function? The short answer is that it's a linear functional. A linear functional eats a continuous function and spits out a number in a continuous way. Applying a linear functional is sort of like taking a measurement of a function. You feed it a function, and it gives you back a numerical answer, and measuring two functions which are close should give close numerical answers, which is what it means for a functional to be continuous. Linear functionals also need to have the linearity property, which should look familiar if you've seen some linear algebra. This just says that the linear functional applied to a constant times f is the same thing as, as that constant times the linear functional of f. Similarly, if you take the linear functional of the sum of two functions, in other words, you take the measurement of a sum, you should get back the sum of the measurements, or the sum of the functionals. For example, taking the average value of a function is a linear functional, since integrals are linear, and two close functions will have close averages. Now, the surprising fact is that integration with respect to any measure also defines a linear functional. To get even more surprising, the converse of this statement is also true. Namely, we can represent any linear functional on the space of continuous functions via integration with respect to some measure. This is a rather deep fact called the Ries Markov Kakutani theorem, but unfortunately, this is a bit beyond the scope of this video. So, if we take mu to be the Dirac measure, we arrive at our final, truly rigorous definition of the Dirac delta. It's a linear functional on the space of continuous functions that returns the value of f at zero. And it's given by integration with respect to the Dirac measure. Furthermore, as we saw, we can intuitively think of this as the usual integral of f of x times a density function, which is infinite at zero and zero elsewhere. So that ends our discussion of the Dirac Delta. I hope you enjoyed the video, and keep learning.